So chapter 13 of non-bank finance. Bank finance. So how many of you are familiar with the Motley Pool? Have you heard of the Motley Pool? They've got some different publications. They do op-ed pieces and then they've got their own podcasts and um, they, I don't know what else, other media stuff. But it's just some people that do uh, analysis of investing. It's probably be pretty interesting to hear their uh, GameStop stuff. But um, I pulled this up from a while back just to look at um, what they had to say about a balance sheet for uh, an insurance company. And so here is uh, progressive insurance is this first column and Mercury General is the second column, just to kind of give you an idea of the types of things that are on there. So we did, we talked about this last time. What are, what does the insurance company do? How do they make their money? How, do they, how does an insurance company make money? I guess that was a good way to start. I don't know if we explicitly stated it that way uh, yesterday. Ready? Okay, so people pay them premiums, they invest in the market. That's part of the equation, yeah, isn't it, So in the case of life insurance, you don't die. They're better off uh, the longer you hang on, uh, right? So their cost of doing business, in other words, is the payouts. So on the revenue side, they bring money in in terms of premiums, so that's their revenue. And then their expenses is paying out benefits. And that's their uh, profit and loss statement. And so here is a copy of their balance sheet um, from, this is way back to 2005, but it doesn't really matter. We're just kind of looking at it. These numbers are in, I'll put a on here. Yeah, it's kind of a big piece of paper. Um, so we got the top line here, fixed maturity securities. Fixed maturity securities, $10,000. That's not too bad. Or what's the unit of measurement here? Millions. Millions. So it's 10,000 million, which is uh, 10 billion. So this is progressive insurance, fixed maturity securities. What sort of stuff is in that? Fixed security maturities. What are they buying with that? Treasury bills or bond, and bonds in general, right? So if you're the insurance company, you predicted that, okay, Jacob's going to die potentially in uh, you know, another 50 years, given where he's at in life, but there's a 4% chance. If you guys only have about a 4.5% chance of dying by accident your entire life, not too bad. Not too good either. Really. A lot of usually catches people by surprise. So then there's kind of this awesome table. Actually, let me show you guys this. I haven't looked at it for a while. Let's find the marker today. Don't tell me I didn't bring my markers. I could have sworn I could Dang. Oh, I, I looked on the internet. It's not easy to find. So I'll show you guys this next time. But um, it's an actuarial table of accidents by death. And then they have it broken down into by assault rifle, by terrorist attack, by bombings, by walking, pedestrian accidents, get, get hit by a car, get in a car accident, bicycle accident. So they have all of the ways you can die by accident. Super cool if you're into this stuff, right? Um, and so it shows there's like three pages of different ways you can die by accident. And maybe more importantly, the associated probability with dying death. Um, and they included both, like, your probability of dying this year that way versus the probability of dying over your entire lifetime that way. So this is what actuarial, actuarial science is and what the actuaries do uh, because they have to have pretty good estimates of that. So if we know that we're definitely going to be paying out X amount 10 years from now, they're kind of thinking at least part of their portfolio is to have a bond that's a 10-year bond that comes due 10 years from now, right? So they have a, a whole schedule of, of maturities that is gonna cover uh, those payoffs. And so that's a way to hedge their bet. Um, we also have some preferred stock. What 
what's preferred stock versus common stock? We don't usually talk about that one very much. It's kind of a little more obscure. Let me go to JC. Okay, preferred stock gets paid first. So, and in the, uh, let's talk a little bit about bankruptcy. If there's a bankruptcy and if there's anything left in the pot for owners of the company, the preferred stockholders have preference over the common stockholders. So that's another thing. Uh, in the ranking in a bankruptcy, the bondholders are going to go first, then the preferred stock, then the common stock. And so if there's any money left over, then the common stockholders might get something. Otherwise, they're the ones at the bottom of the totem pole um, in terms of that. So point being that having preferred stock, uh, they got 1.2 billion of preferred stock. A lot of people don't buy preferred stock, but the insurance companies do because they're being cautious. They want to know that's a way to hedge their bet a little bit. If they pay a little bit of a premium, preferred stock's going to be a little more expensive than common stock. So that's the insurance company thinking about all their assets. So now as we go down the list, they get smaller. So 10 billion, 1.2 billion, 2 billion. Uh, premiums receivable. What's that? Premiums receivable. Those of you who are accounting majors maybe can help us out with that. Is that when you have like someone owes you a premium basically, but you haven't received the money for that premium yet? Yep, it's just accounts receivable, right? Somebody owes you the money, they've been contracted, but you haven't gotten it in the door yet. So the accounts receivable, premiums receivable, $2.5 billion. If that tells you about the dollar volume that they're doing, on, that's people that owe them some premiums that are behind on the bills or whatever. So reinsurance is something we'll talk about later that they can kind of, the insurance company can actually take out insurance on their insurance. And so there's kind of a reinsurance possibility. And then all of the stuff down, income tax and property, other assets. So that's kind of the asset side. Um, and then what they do is they kind of break it down. So the Motley Fool likes to try to put it in simple person's terms here. I'm just going to look at progressives so I can blow it up a little bit higher. So now look at how they consolidated the balance sheet to make it real simple here. 14.2 billion of assets, policyholder money that we don't have yet. That's kind of the receivable side and then other assets. So there's the other uh, assets that they have. And then if we look at a simplified balance sheet, uh, let's see, liabilities and equity, here we go. Policyholder money we have, right? But we might have to return. So if they paid their annual premium up front, but the insurance policy goes for the upcoming year, they have to treat that differently than money that was actually paid, right? So technically it's a liability on the books because if that person cancels their policy, they get the refund back for the unused part of their insurance. So they have some of that money here. And again, company to company, those dollar values are going to change uh, depending on, on what they have. Uh, and then debt. So you can look at the debt, other liabilities, shareholders equity, and total liabilities and equity. Now, if any of this is foreign to you, you should not be buying single stocks at all on Robinhood or any other app. If any of what I said doesn't make sense to you, you shouldn't be buying that stuff. You're gambling. If you're buying single stocks and you don't know a single word I said or even all of what I said, that's what you need to do. This type of analysis, and this is just quick and dirty. We're not even done yet. We've spent a little bit of time looking at it. Um, you need to be spending significant amounts of time to really learn about the company, what is the value, underlying value. All of that is kind of the Warren Buffett style value investing that you need to do. Um, so this, I'm kind of, this is kind of on top of my mind because Peter and I were just going through our uh, presentation for tomorrow. Like we're doing the PGD, which is kind of fun. Uh, and we will be recording that so we can uh, send it out to you guys if you want. So that is the insurance company. So as you go to think about um, insurance for this class, we're just really mostly focusing in on you know, what is the role of them being a financial intermediary? Where do they get their money from? And that's part of the, that, that's part of the system. And so this just kind of 
goes to show you the details of this particular business and their balance sheet. Um, questions or comments on that? I just wanted to kind of show you that to kind of get your juices flowing because it's much different than a bank, but yet there's similarities to the bank as far as being part of the financial uh, financial structure of our economy. All right. So who else plays a role? So yesterday we talked about pension funds, and we ended with the government and their supposed safety net for retirees. Uh, what's the name of that one called? Social Security. Oh, now I am really in trouble. I got to do my part first. Uh, let's see. We have to get the timer out again. I need my markers. There's no more. Let me see. I can't even do this without it. So that's good. All right. I need the timer. You got the timer? I got it. Oh, you got a marker, JC? Uh, is it good? I mean, that's why I don't use that brand because it's like, well, let me try. I'll 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 try. i will you guys read that? See how thin it is and uh, thin and weak. But if you guys can tolerate it, I'll tolerate it. Okay, so um, so finance companies are uh, compared to banks are virtually unregulated. Um, so compared to banks. Russ, can you turn the phone a little bit? I can't see the entire board, like a little yeah. bit less than the cutoff. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Thank you. There we go. And then, yeah, can you guys pick up this marker okay when you zoom in? Lou, the guys on Zoom, can you read that all right with it? It's okay, yeah. All right. You guys just need to move up closer, Jason. <laughs> Oh, and there's, we got lots of space. Look at Jeremiah. Kayla's got an empty chair next year. So compared to banks, um, they are virtually unregulated. Because as we learned in even our Alice book and otherwise, uh, the financial industry is heavily regulated, or the banking industry is. Okay, so what do we mean by these things? So you got the sales finance company. So General Motors Credit, for instance, started off this way, GM Credit. Um, in my personal finance class, there's a, a pet care credit for if you get a, uh, a, um, a vet bill that you can't afford and little, little Bowser has to have a little surgery or something for a couple thousand bucks. So, they will hand you that brochure, and then you can apply for different credit depending on uh, a sale that you're trying to do usually. So a car credit, pet care credit, whatever. Um, uh, it can be uh, the store cards as well. Uh, so anything like that kind of falls into this finance, uh, uh, finance element. Um, and then we've got business finance. So you've got leasing companies, so equipment leasing for like a restaurant. Um, if you need a new grill or a deep fryer or something, so you can do all kinds of leasing of equipment. All of that is borrowing. They could have went to a bank to borrow the money, but they chose this alternative champ. Right, so that's why it's a, it's a non-bank channel. Uh, it's possible that your car loan could be bundled up into a, instead of a mortgage-backed security, a car loan-backed security. So Wall Street did that too. So these guys can sell off 10,000 of these finance deals 
bundle them up just like they did mortgages and sell them to Wall Street. And some investor then, you know, that everything could be priced. So bundled as a, as a product, you have a diversified thing, pretty much no, the default rates are whatever, X percent, let's say 10%. And so you know that about 90% of these people are gonna pay their bills, 10% won't. Uh, the total loan outstanding is $10 billion. So, hey, I'll sell it to you for 9 billion. You want it? Sure. Right? 9 billion, I've done the math. Uh, there's 10,000 car loans bundled in that. Sounds like a good financial product to me, right? So Wall Street bundles up some sort of new uh, asset, and now that's a tradable commodity. Whereas your particular car loan, all by its lonesome, wouldn't be a tradable thing that Wall Street would be interested in buying, right? A, it's not a big enough money. B, it's like investing in a single stock. They don't want to invest in a single stock. They don't know enough information about rest of the fellow if it's worth investing in or not. But we're just going to look at you as kind of a non-person part of this package of loans and uh, hope that it works out. Hope that another financial crisis doesn't come along and uh, take down the value. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, financial facilitators. Financial facilitators. Facilitators. So your author calls like investment banks this type of thing. Financial facilitators, uh, securities brokers. Uh, organized exchanges. So NASDAQ. Organized stock markets. Places where people can buy, sell. Somebody has to do that. There's a cost of doing it. So there's business to be done. So that's what uh, looks like that's what investment banks here, not just investment. Investment banks. Well, notice the difference between these guys and the finance company. They're just bringing two different parties together, right? And probably having some sort of fee or user fee, subscription fee, um, all kinds of different ways that they might make money, but they're not actually doing the investment. Now, investment banks might be doing multiple things. So this is just highlighting one role that they might have as a financial facilitator. All right, so that's gonna lead to investment banking being its own category. So investment banking. So investment banks primarily assist in the sale of securities. So they might give advice on whether to do a bond issue or a stock issue. So advise firm on doing Stocks or bonds, for instance, or both. So, what sort of advice would they need? Like with a bond, what sort of advice would they be giving them? Rating. Rating. Okay, good. What else? So, they would help them get the rating. By the way, they don't do the rating. Remember, that's Standard and Poor's, the S&P or uh, one of the other rating agencies, but they would assist them in getting rated, yes. What else was related to bonds? Yield to maturity. Yeah, yield to maturity. How long is it going to be? Should you do a five-year bond? Is it more advantageous to do a three-year, a seven-year? You know, what's the market? So we can talk about uh, maturity. And as Eddie said, assisting with rating, assisting with connection, to rating. 
they might get the ball rolling. It's like, oh, we only got you a double B rating. So maybe it'd be better to do a stock issue, right? They're going to kind of grapple through the pros and cons of uh, where, what might be best for them long-term, depending on what their objectives are as to whether to go in um, borrowing or, or equity. If they go with stocks, what are they going to be advising them on there for initial public offering? We talked about this before. With what? Yes. What's that? Earnings per share. Okay, earnings per share depending on the price, right? So, yeah, the share price is a big thing. So, relative to earnings and where that puts them at. So, uh, with stocks, uh, advice on uh, price or maybe the initial public offering. I just heard a weird thing on the news. I'm kind of curious if any of you have heard this. Um, I think the news reporter was a little bit either mistaken or not sure what they were talking about, but it was kind of interesting. They said one strategy for GameStop or a company that's in a GameStop type situation where today it was still trading north of 100, and you know, for all intents and purposes, it looks like it should be around 20, let's say, or something, would be for the company to sell their own stock or to initi to uh, uh, issue more shares is the way she worded it. And that's kind of an interesting thing, um, but I'm not sure how that would work because the way she worded it, what happens if the company GameStop issues new stock? In terms of, in, in addition to what's already floating around up, price is going to go down, right? So, what about the people who are holding the current shares? Value those shares. Value those shares. So, are they going to be on board with that? What are they going to do as soon as the word comes out on the street that they're going to do that? Sell. What's going to happen to price? Drop. So, I think it's really, and also, I think. Um, before they'd be able to issue new stocks, there would have to be a process probably involving the SEC and uh, a shareholder vote or whatever. So I'm seeing this as a kind of a long process. So it didn't really make sense to me um, what she might have been even talking about. So I don't know if, if you guys have been doing more research than me on stuff, if you on this particular item with GameStop, um, if there's something I'm not seeing, but I, I have one idea, but I'm, I'm not sure. I just have a question. Okay. Um, so you're saying an investment banker would advise at the price of like four back here? Yes. The how initial would, price. How how would that be determined? Just by like, like everything. All, like yeah, everything. Order. So all of the technical stuff, the stuff that I said, reading a balance sheet, income statement, you know, what is the actual value of the company? And are, are these numbers that like you know, they have a formula and they plug it all into, or can the price fluctuate? Like obviously there's gonna be some set things that like value the company out. Yeah, there's also something that fluctuates. Well, I can get worth this, right? I can get worth that. Yeah, so all of that stuff, they're going to have formulas, spreadsheets, blah, 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 and all that. But ultimately, it's going to come down to um, what are our consumer expectations? What are our expectations about the next five years? Is there new products in the pipeline? So it's going to involve a, a decent amount of uncertainty. And if you put too much blue sky, is what it's called. Blue sky is like the high in the sky dreams of, oh, we're currently at $20, but I bet we're going to be at 40 And so let's issue our stock at 40 If you put too much blue sky into it, what's going to happen? Who's going to want to buy it at 40 Not too many people if it's a lot of blue sky. Now, a little bit of blue sky. So you got to kind of find that sweet spot. And that's what the investment bank's going to do. They're going to, they might do surveys of their well-known clients to say, hey, if this company came on, you know, would you be on board for, you know, something or where do you value this company or whatever. So they're going to have a research base of a, of a lot of that stuff uh, to figure out what that initial price uh, should be. And that's definitely an art form because they can't perfectly predict, you know, what the public is going to think. Like when Facebook came out, uh, anybody know what happened to Facebook when it came out? Too much blue sky. Now it ended up rebounding, and once they got their business model, but when Facebook went out, they're like, this company doesn't even make any money. It was hard for people to see how it was going to be profitable. And so, you know, the whole advertising 
uh, engine that we're all accustomed to now, that wasn't developed at that time. They didn't know if that was going to work or not, or how much companies were willing to pay. Of course, the more people that have eyeballs on Facebook, the better. But when they went public, which I don't remember how long ago that was, shoot, 10 plus, 13 years ago, before I even came to Ottawa, um, th that was an unknown commodity. So, um, so it tanked. I think it took about a, if I remember right, maybe about a year for it to, to get back to what the initial public offering price was. So it, some people bet and lost right away, and if they held on, then they, they probably were okay. Um, but if they had short-term profits in mind, then they don't. All right, um, so let's see, stocks. Any other questions or comments, sir? All right, um, so investment banks are regulated by the SEC. So this is still under the investment bank. <laughs> Uh, option here. So regulated, regulated by the SEC. So not the Federal Reserve like banks are, but a different arm of government, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So they have, you know, rules in place. And, and that's another thing that they're going to advise the new company on, of like, what are the financial documents that I need if I want to go public, right? What do I have to disclose? What do I not have to disclose? All of those regulations, um, the investment bank is going to be an expert on that. They're going to have very expensive attorneys that know the answer to just about every question as soon as you ask it without having to Google it because you can't Google stuff like that, right? Because it's going to be probably very specific to their circumstances. Okay. Uh, next one, securities. Uh, brokers and dealers. So a lot of times they're the same, but there is a fundamental difference between a stock broker and a stock dealer. So anybody know the difference between a dealer and a broker? Eddie? Dealer have, like presents you with a bunch of stocks and that broker goes and finds you stocks. Kind of, yeah. So when you say they present you, what do you mean? Who, who owns it? Like the dealer owns it. The dealer owns it, yeah. So it's a matter of holding inventory. So uh, the dealers actually are um, have ownership of some of the stocks, whereas the idea of brokerage is to bring buyer and seller together. Right. So they don't ever take ownership, uh, but rather the dealer might have uh, a million shares of GameStop or something on hand. And so you come to them, and then they might kind of deal them to you. They're part of the selling uh, machine of it. Now, in reality, they kind of do both, but it's uh, those two functions are are different. So brokers, brokers are uh, agents for investors. Agents for investors. So being an agent means you are going to look for deals for your particular client. So we're going to match uh, buyers and sellers together. <clears throat> and the most important part is you get permission is how you make money. So when I was a real estate broker, I didn't ever buy the house and take ownership of the house. I just brought a buyer and a seller together, and we sold the house for 100000 and I got 6% at the end. So a $6,000 check as part of the transaction fees came to my brokerage, right? So I got paid with a commission of some sort. And dealers... So dealers, um, they're going to be standing by ready to sell. Stand by ready to buy or sell. So they are potentially holding inventories of stocks or bonds for that matter. And so what's the fundamental way that dealers get paid?
by selling their own. And so what are they going to do? Charge us profit that's called the spread. Somebody else brought this up before. What is the, you see a price, there'll be a, a what certain type of price and a certain type of price and there's a difference between, what's that? The bid and ask, yes. So when you see the bid and ask price, that is dependent on if you're selling or buying. And so they're going to capture that spread. So they get paid, uh, they get the spread between the bid and the ask. So they might hold it for just a little bit, but whoever comes to the table, um, so dealers, especially with uh, options and futures, um, they're going to be putting up prices of bid and ask uh, and ready to, if somebody wants to buy a 30 day option on GameStop or something, they're going to have a price for that. If they want to have a price, maybe that one's crazy enough that they are uh, not going to want to hold any, any inventory. Okay. And then the last one to kind of tie these together is a brokerage firm, which is probably going to be fulfilling both the broker and the dealer function. So a brokerage firm this usually acts as brokers uh, dealers and investment banks. Some of those functions. So Goldman Sachs is going to do a little bit of everything. And this is all SEC regulated. Now, do you see any potential for conflicts of interest? Kind of moral hazard type problems for people doing kind of a little bit of everything or companies doing a little bit of everything. What could be, a, I think there's one glaring one up here that could be a conflict of interest. You see? Uh, Okay, yeah. So what end of this what end of the spectrum are you on? If you're a dealer and you have some stock that you really want to unload and push it off, then maybe I have my guys who are have clients and say, hey, let's just get, get this one out the door, right? And because we're gonna make a quick buck on this. Uh, I want you to screw over your clients for just this time, just this time. They won't ever even know. It's actually only going to be a few pennies. They'll be in and out of the transaction so fast it won't matter. Right? So it's not like some movie plots that we've seen, maybe. Right? That happens. I mean, happen. that's part of the reason that we have things like the Glass-Steagall Act that was proposed to try to keep certain activities siloed. Right? Instead of having one mega company that does a little bit of everything, which then could bring up some moral hazard and conflict of interest problems, let's kind of keep some of this stuff siloed in different areas. And so some, you know, restrictions have kind of come and go and, and uh, been relaxed and then reinforced uh, with the Dodd-Frank stuff that we did last chapter, you know, being one that kind of tightened that down. So as we get, dive deeper and deeper into this stuff, we start to see the connections uh, where some of this stuff might uh, be important. Okay. Um, so organized exchanges. Get this one. So I mentioned NASDAQ already. What are some of the other organized exchanges that are important around the world? So Russell 2000. Now that's a, is that an exchange? What is the Russell 2000 since you, I didn't see who brought that up. Is that you, JC? Is that an exchange? Okay, it's a group of stocks. And I think, Jacob, you mentioned S&P 500. 
Is that an exchange? <coughs> so New York Stock Exchange, that having that word at the exchange is kind of the key to it. So the S&P 500 is just somebody monitoring the market caps from highest to lowest of the top 500 stocks. The Russell 2000 is uh, organizing the stocks of the smaller cap companies, the top 2,000 of those companies, right? Why do they do that? Why do we have the S&P 500 with the top ones and then like, let's say the Russell 2000 for the smaller ones? Okay, and so what? why would that be helpful as we go to invest money in, I don't know, let's say Apple. Just pick one right out of the air. So I'm going to invest in Apple. Why would I care about looking at somebody who compiled the S&P 500? What would I want to do? How could I find it useful? So the S&P has aggregated the top 500 companies together so that you can see plus 10%, up 10%, down 5%, 1%. So if we're looking at a chart, we're looking at the aggregate of 500 companies. Why might that be helpful if I'm thinking about buying Apple? What's that? To compare it, right? So should I buy Apple? Well, Apple's done 12% uh, return over the last five years, but the S&P 500 has done 14%. <laughs> So that gives you at least one piece of information that Apple has been below what their benchmark peers, if, if you consider the top 500 to be benchmark, which may or may not, but we're going to use that S&P 500 to be as a benchmark. Now, what some of you might be getting um, confused on is, can you buy the S&P 500? My you can, yeah, can you buy, basically, can you buy those 500 stocks as one so that you're essentially buying the index? Yes. It's a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, right? So all you're doing is a broker, one of our people that we're talking here, has a product that simply copies what Standard & Poor's S&P does the 500. Whatever S&P, when they come out periodically with their updated list, that broker goes and changes their portfolio to perfectly match the S&P 500. So when you buy the S&P 500, you're not actually buying all 500 stocks, you're buying it from Standard & Poor's, you're buying it from the brokerage firm that did that. Maybe it's American Century or Vanguard. Vanguard's pretty famous for this, with coming up with index funds. So Vanguard, the company, is just matching perfectly the S&P 500, and that's what you're actually buying, not all of them. All right, we will see you. We're going to talk hedge fund structure, by the way, to tantalize you for Thursday. And then read that chapter three. We'll see you on Thursday.